Porsche brings out their new LMP1 contender for the 24-hour Le Mans. Cadillac sales are on fire as they name a new conglomerate ad agency. And we're going to have some of the true believers that I talk about in this town as our special guest tonight later when we have two uh, Lincoln designers on the program. So stay tuned. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone, your journey, our passion. This is Auto Line After Hours with Peter DiLorenzo, episode 200 for June 14th, 2013. Inside Lincoln Design. Watch AutoLine After Hours live at AutoLine.tv every Thursday at 6 p.m. Eastern Time or 2200 GMT. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or by following the links on our website. Jim Hall. That's me. The man who knew too much. 2953 Analytics, kids. Welcome to another Auto Line. I'm Peter DiLorenzo, the Auto Extremist, and we have a really cool show for you today, uh, tonight. Um, I, I speak about the true believers in this business all the time, and we're going to have two of them here live and in color on our set. So stay tuned. They're from Lincoln. They're two talented female designers, and uh, we're very proud to have them on the show. So, Jim? Yep. Let's talk about the news. The news. Well, i got to tell you, the uh, Porsche LMP car is amazing in that they've done, uh, just looking at the car, then the first shots were the four lights that look like the, L the LED detail DRLs in the Panamera. Yeah. It's, it's pretty spectacular. Well, first of all, I love the fact that they put the... the, the the photo print wrap on it. Yes. So you couldn't make out the details. Secondly, I have inside, there it is on our screen. Yep. Secondly, I have inside info uh, on the car from people who are intimately involved in the uh, design and uh, concept. And from my, what I understand, it is the most radical approach, technical approach underneath that they're not talking about yet uh, that's ever been seen before. This is going to be, well, as it should be. Excellence is expected at Porsche. They haven't been at the race in 14 years. Uh, they have built up their product line through selling uh, SUVs and uh, Panamera sedans, but they've kept the true believers interested and enthused because they keep bringing out the, the 911, the Cayman S, and the Boxster. But Porsche needs to race, and they need to win. And another interesting thing about this project is Ferdinand Piek, the head of the Volkswagen conglomerate, didn't ask Audi to stand down. Now, well, that, that's my whole question about what's going to happen to Le Mans, is, you know, has that car got the stuff to beat the new, basically, the, the, the Ultra, the, the Quattro Ultra? The thing's hybrid, it's a diesel, it's pretty damn cool. And they've done more to the car than the car they won with last year. Yes, but the Audi to the new rules has not appeared yet. Now, the Porsche is a gasoline engine. I know. The so, Audi will be a diesel, we know that. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. It's going to be very interesting, but Piac didn't ask Audi to stand down. Audi's won, what, 12 times? Mm -hmm. And so he's gonna, it's going to be an intramural battle to end all battles. Is Toyota back? I haven't paid attention. Yeah, Toyota's back, but they asked for a rule change this year to, for Audi because they said otherwise we're going to run fourth and fifth. Now, oh. they were supposed to meet on that this week. I have not heard what's happened. Okay. But, you know, Audi's in a different league. Be but it, because the thing is that the Toyota was so creepy. When it came into the pits, as soon as it crossed that line, the engine shut off. Yeah. And it's just this car driving fully electric down the pit road at, uh, what is it, 80 kilometers per hour, 90 kilometers per hour? No, the limit is, uh, yeah, yeah, 60 miles an hour. Yeah, that's almost 100 kilometers per hour. And it comes zooming down there. When it takes off, it takes, the engine starts, but the car takes off with the engine idling. Yeah. And it, it's just freaky when you see the car. It's strange. So, uh, Jim, you had an interesting design brief on, on my show today at noon. And the you, design handbook, yes, the new feature. You talk, talked about the concept of lifting the pen. And for the uh, viewers out there, that's in the design world, my favorite part of the car business. Um, 
you know, there's a lot of talent at work in these design houses, and they do some great stuff, but sometimes they just over-design. And there's a point where you lift the pen and say, okay, that's enough. It's done. It's perfect. Yes, but you mentioned... The, the Lexus RX, first of all, I just want to say that there seems to be that the pendulum is moving towards lots of vehicles with superfluous sort of forms on the cars, and I also call it surface excitement, but there's too much surface excitement. And the Lexus RX is one of these that where I first saw the car, I'm looking at it, and it's like, okay, they've got these sort of separate fender forms. They had this real strong shoulder on the side of the car. They could have done one or the other. They did them both. And then there's this gratuitous little knockout, and it's, it's like, guys, just stop. Yes. And the thing is, there are more and more cars like that. And that was an interesting choice to talk about, but I'd rather talk about the new C7, Jim, because that was one car that I, I, you know, I've taken huge heat from a lot of quarters because I'm one of the few people that's come out that was a little disappointed in it. Now, I like the Roadster mm -hmm. much better, but the Coupe... One of the problems I have with a car... Because it's, 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 it's sort of a total inelegance to the car. And, it, and is the Corvette supposed to be elegant? In a way, it is, yes. All sports cars, to me, have to have a certain bit of functional, yes. But the car, first of all, they're, they're going into the carbon fiber roof, black wheels, you know, lots of contrast trim on the car. Well, the, the roof uh, homage to the GTR, one of my least favorite. But it isn't an homage. It's a copy. Yeah, That's the thing. it's bad. I, the thing is. It shouldn't be on that car. Well, watch. What bothers me the most is when I saw this car at first, I was looking at all the stuff, like the rocker form and so on. But when, now when I see the car, my eye immediately goes to the roof and the fact that it is a GTR roof, down to sort of the brow on the top, the way they wrap over the top of the A-pillars. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah it well, there it is. And it just, it's, it's wrong. A Corvette, a Corvette is supposed to make you think of a very exotic, expensive car, if you think of a car, another car at all. Think of the 68 Corvette really channeled in a, in a Bill Mitchell way the Series 2 Ferrari GTO. Right. And there's nothing wrong with a Corvette making you think about a Ferrari. Well, that was kind of a GM tradition. Exactly. It started by Mitchell when they... But when I look at a Corvette, I shouldn't be thinking about a GTR. I'm sorry. Well, that's... It's... And I went on record, and, and I got a slam, but that's okay. I stand by what I... My at the back of the car, they've done this splitter affair that is a festival of semi-gloss black plastic. Yeah. All right? Um, as a splitter, I'm sure that it's probably 50% cosmetic, 50% functional. The problem is, whenever you start doing a massive stuff in black in a car, to me, it reads as nothing. It's gaping space. And it's one thing to have a C uh, C5. Yeah, the C5 that looked like a diapered baby with a full load in the back. The fascia was just too severe, too large. It's just... A white one was pretty grim. And the, the C6 crispened it up a little bit, but now they've gone just the opposite. It's like... There's some middle ground where you can find, and they, there's no middle ground on the new Corvette. Yeah. It's sort of like, how bold can we be? And so when they did the convertible, I, I liked that better because the roof was gone. Yeah. So let's see, what else can we talk about? Cadillac sales, are, you know, they're up. Mm -hmm. And they just had announced this ad agency. Uh, agencies. Which is three agencies, Hill Holiday to do creative, Camley Wall to do account, and Lowe's to do digital. And as an ad veteran, we commonly refer to this as a cluster, you know Something what? Something or other, yeah. And uh, it's just, it's, and I read the releases and I know they're well-intentioned. How, but how, Peter, do you have the account people do what they have to do when the creative people are nowhere around? Now, they're going to have to co-locate, I know, but it's still going to be another business. It's, 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 it's just asking. It, it's a recipe for disaster, and I, I just I hated to see it. But, you know, uh, there's a little disease going on in GM right now where they really think they're the smartest guys in the room, and they get that from their uh, leader. You mean the man that you jovially Captain, refute, Captain, Captain Queeg. Queeg. And, uh, you know, I, it's, it's unfortunate, but, you know, and, and I, I wish them the best, but that's not the way to do it, you know? But they, it's just really not the way to do it. So let's have some fun. Oh, Toyota is making rumblings that will never recapture the market that they had. I don't think they will. Why? There's too much competition. Exactly. Well, you know, if you think about it, when they were at their peak, 
Hyundai and Kia were really players that were there, but they weren't in the in the fray. They weren't. They were sort of at the edges. Now they're one of the one of the competitors. So anything you lost to them, you're going to have to fight like the Dickens to get back. Yeah. I think it's smart because it infers they're not going to spend money like a drunken sailor to try to get back share they won't get, which is one of the problems GM had. Yes. So Jim. Yes. Most desirable cars available. Not the best necessarily. Mm -hmm. Most desirable mm -hmm. in the U.S. currently under three hundred thousand dollars. See, I, I love this because under three hundred thousand, there's lots of stuff. <laughs> I'm going to mention a few. That doesn't mean that's my final list because if I start on a list, a list of five grows to twelve, which is as it should be. Yeah. So Porsche Cayman S. I'll, I'll, I'll challenge you on that one. You want it the box? 911.50. Okay, 911.50. Uh, the obliga obligatory Ferrari pick, the Ferrari 458 Italia. However, I will say this. I kind of like the 599 GTB. I saw one the other day on mm -hmm. the road in black. Kind of liked it. But the 458 Italia, what's not to like? Rolls-Royce Ghost or Bentley Mulsanne? Okay, for me, I put a, the new Corvette in there for the way it will drive. On, uh, in my first cut, I'm not okay, going down well, far. My first cut was the current Corvette 427 convertible. It's pretty hard to, that, I, that's, a, that's a tough one to beat. Peter. And I said, let the first on the block frenzy for the C7 play out while you enjoy probably the best Corvette built to date. Yeah, yep. But the C7 would be on the list. The C7. Um, the thing is with, with high-end cars, they, there's a, a, a thing, if you're going to spend that much money for a car, and a Ghost is a usable car. But when you talk about the 458, I like the 458, but to me... It's not usable. It's not usable, and I would pick, instead of the 458, and it's, it's appreciably cheaper, Audi R8 V10. Well, I mentioned the R Audi... I know. But <laughs> I, I know. You, mentioned, you, you want the Audi R8 V10. But not the Plus. No, but I like the V8 because I think it's the closest thing to a mid-engine Corvette that anyone in this country will ever see. Oh, uh, you're right about that. So, and I love the way it sounds. Yep. And uh, the, the, the 300000 is tough because my, my car, if I had to buy one car for the, the rest, that's me the rest of my life, it costs more than that. So I'm not going to even mention it. We'll let yeah, people no, guess. That's, that wasn't the no. most um, desirable. You're right. It turns you on. My, my barometer is when you walk up to it, you smile. And when you walk away, I'll tell you, another one. you have to look at it just one more time. M6 Grand Coupe. Seriously. Seriously. Wow. The M, there's, something about the, there's something about the Grand Coupe. Um, for one thing, I think the car looks better with the extra wheelbase in it. I think it looks better with the extra wheelbase. It does look good in the road. I'll give it and, that. And the M6 in the right color is one of those cars that is, it's, it's, it's an icon because you know it is a serious performance car and it looks great and it's highly desirable. So that makes it to me one of those desirable cars. And, and long before an M5, which is arguably a better car. This, yeah, this just doesn't do anything for but, me. But I, that, that, to me, is definitely one of them. What else can we argue about? What other car do you want that I don't want? Uh, well, Cadillac CTS V Coupe. Oh, I, okay? I agree with I, you. I'm sorry. No, that, you don't and, apologize. That and, is one of, that is the design of the moment. And I saw one today in a color that they, they it was a color they actually launched on, uh, the terrain in the Equinox called Mocha Steel, and it's a charcoal that's very, very warm that actually has some brown in it. I saw one coming towards me uh, with the non-polished, just the painted wheels, and it, there was something about it. It just looked right in the sunlight, and it's like, yep, pretty darn good. That, I believe, is the build-out uh, special blue edition they're doing that has a navy blue interior, which is actually one of my pet peeves. I love navy blue interiors, and you got to end up spending stupid money to get a car with navy blue yeah. interiors. Yeah, uh, the CTS V Coupe is... It's a tough one to beat. Yeah, it's a great car. It, it, it's going to be one of those cars in 25 years that's still going to look good. It's also, I think it's going to be one of those cars that's going to be highly collectible in about 25 or 30 years. It'll have this time where it's just a used car, which is the time to buy them, folks. But uh, it's, it's going to... Well, collecting is difficult, though. It is. It's playing Russian roulette with an automatic pistol. Well, you don't want to be the first guy up. Well, I know, I know uh, quite a few of my buddies have a lot of cars, and uh, I just... Peter, when I, I say collectible, I don't mean collectible for money, for enhancement. I'm talking about a car that would be desirable that people will say, oh, very cool. Okay. Not, not investment stuff. Yeah. I, I, investment stuff, you end up with things like, um, 
Ralph Lauren's fiasco that was going on at some concourse where he, people would try to take pictures, and he says, you should ask to take, he has his little helpers say, you should ask to take pictures of the car. You're at a concourse delegates. It's a public place, for God's sake. What do you think? I remember thinking? I was standing right next to him at Pebble Beach, uh, and he was, you know, he was posing. Of course. Because that's what he does. Yes. He had a double breasted navy blazer and white pants on. And now, if he had a triple breasted blazer, I would be impressed, okay? <laughs> I would be genuinely impressed. But, uh, but he's got some fine cars, however. He does. But, but he, has this, he has this inability to restore them. He improves them. Yeah, I know, but, that, you know. The man had the most original f uh, Series 1 Ferrari GTO on Earth, and he decided the color wasn't right. It was the original paint, and he made it a different color red because it was the correct red. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, Lord. That's not so good. No. Don't get me started. Oh, ben, I think I've lost. Everything is lost. What am I doing? Yeah, forget it. You know, the, the segment that was today, we're going to be doing those in the future, too. There's some more coming up. Design handbook? Design handbook. There's some others coming up. Sports car proportions is one of them. Huh. That's a new one. Uh, why gas caps aren't universal. Sports car proportion. Mm -hmm. Long hood, short rear deck. Mm-hmm. Mid-engined. Uh, what are they? Long well, hood, short deck, mid-engine. Stop and think about it. Sports car proportion. The Lamborghini Miura was the first transverse mid-engine sports car, a car ever built, right? That, that looked like a front-engine car. It, exactly. Even they knew that they couldn't mess too much with the, the long hood that sports cars are supposed to have. You know, and, and people have done it at their own peril. I'm giving away a lot of the segment, but the M100 Lotus Elan, great car to drive. But boy, I'll tell you, that front wheel center line, that axle was actually slightly aft of the base of the windshield because it had a lot of plan view in it. But that's one of them. We've got the difference between design and style, which is one of my pet peeves. Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a good one. Uh, straight skinny on dash to axle. And then we're also going to do the first of a series, which is called Design Spaz Attacks. And the first one is not going to be an Aztec, which is it's too easy. We found something even more horrendous. I keep saying people forget the original concept. And how good it looked. It was a classic example of they had a sketch called the Recon that was amazing. And then they turned the Recon into the Aztec concept car. Because they only had one platform that they could use, which changed everything. the whole thing. But I will go on record, and you have too, the concept was brilliant. Exactly. The execution, meh. No, the execution was awful. But the concept, well, it was the forerunner of a lot of things. Exactly. But underneath it was a vehicle called the Bear Claw that they should have built. What else? Uh, most desirable machines under 300,000. Well, I'd have to put Panamera on it. I would put Panamera GTS on it, very specifically the GTS. Okay, because I will agree with you. That's the, that is the, the, the Panamera. And the Panamera, in some ways, is, to me, is the most clinical of all the Porsches. Yeah. But it's the uh, one... It, Cayenne's pretty clinical. It's a whole other thing, though. It's not, it's not a Porsche, okay? Yeah. But in the, there's, there's some, there, I understand the Porsche DNA in it, but I understand that the Panamera is a car that only Porsche could have built. Right. Hey, Ben, uh, we're going to talk about the 911 50th because Jim and I happen to think it's really sweet. Yeah. And if you can find it, it'd be great. If not, it's okay. But the, nine, the 50th anniversary 911... It's just, I mean, just when you think they might be losing it or something. Oh, no, no. I, I don't think they're losing it. And, and I'll tell you, I love the Porsche of the 50th. It's the car. It's one of those 911s I really would like to have. It's not the 911 I want the most. Because Porsche now makes the second best 911 they have ever built. What's the first? The first is a 1967 911R. That is oh, the yeah. greatest 911 ever built, and especially one with the Dash 21 dual plug engine out of the Carrera G 6 GT. I mean, those things are amazing. They're, they're, there's, they only think they only built 19 911 GT or R's. I rode on Jeff Swartz's Carrera 6, so I know what that engine sounds like. Pretty amazing. And, oh, man. Imagine that in a 911 with no sound insulation. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and then the one that I actually am incredibly passionate, would love. There, there it is. There, that is it, and that's the Glacier Gray car. Um, do you notice the license numbers were all either S for Stuttgart, G-O, and it was 1963, and the other one, the other car was 901. Yes. Because the 911 was not introduced as the 911. But look at the details on that car, and for 911 aficionados, this, the detailing was absolutely superb. superb. Yep. 
The, at, apparently, at, well, that's not the interior of it. <laughs> the wheels, uh, the tribute to the Fuchs wheels. Yep. Still like the Fuchs better, but, you know. And there's the, that's actually, the, that's the glacier gray interior, or the, uh, the, um, I got the agate gray interior. But it's got the houndstooth check upholstery, which, you know, I don't think was in the car the first year. No. But, you know, and it's got the five gauge cluster. I absolutely love that automobile. Yes. Ah. Oh, wow. But with the, the, the 911, to me, that has basically, the one I think is the most desirable is the GT3, the new GT3. Uh, yes, but I think I might like the last version, the 4.0, better. The GT3 4.0. This one's faster. Yeah, GT, yeah but the 4.0 is... The, the 4.0 had a little bit of RS in it. One of the, if you, have you ever driven a GT3 and an RS? Yes. The RS is the absolute tippy top of the point where you can't really live with them on a public road. A GT3 you can live with. Yeah. You actually can. And it's about, as, it's about as edgy as you ever want to get. They even did the uh, grill down below being chrome as a tribute to the horn grills on the uh, original 901. Yeah. It's a nice touch. Oh, it's a nice car. <laughs> All right. And you see, there's the, there's the opportunity that Corvette has. The 911 is a family of very different cars with different characters. They can do that with a, with a Corvette. They can. Well, I, you, I did a... I know you did it, but you were doing it by even changing drivetrains. I'm saying they could do it with the base car they have now and come had, across with a no. family of really interesting different cars. I suggested three Corvettes and, you know, yep. had visual support. Yeah, but the mid-engine one, you know, I'm sorry. We want the mid-engine car because of how old we are. The mid-engine Corvette is a car that would be nothing but compromises. Well, you know, it depends at, at what price point they decide to do that. I'm just talking about from a functional standpoint. The Corvette now is a very, very functional automobile for a sports car. Well, mid-engine cars on the street ain't all that great. But there's one that is. Which? The R8 is oh, a car, Audi, but, but un, no, under, no, understand why. The R8 is a car where they compromised the aesthetics to put in a decent seating package, a place for it's large... It's a real car. It is a real car. I, I and, had one for a week, and I, I said... You can use it every day. You can use it every day. And, and the thing is that my concern about a mid-engine Corvette is that understanding the way General Motors works, and especially the way some of the guys work with Corvettes and design, the first thing they would do is take... They'd look at the R8, and then they figure out how to fix it. And the first thing they would do to fix it is lower the roof two inches. And they bring the hood down more. So when they're done, they would have thrown away the function that makes the R8 work. Yeah. And the, the R8 works and doesn't look goofy. I mean, in side view, when you first see it, it is kind of bubble-headed when you see it. You've got to get used to it. But they manage the form so well. And then the, well, just... That's the... That's your mid-engine car. Yeah, which yeah. I loved. It was great. Yeah. But again, it has no headroom. There's no load space under that hood. Come on. Yeah, but like we talked about earlier, if you were just cruising over to Monaco for the weekend... Would, you don't need a truck. Would you care? No. No. All right, Jim, we're going to take a little break, and we're going to bring our special guests up here. And, uh, Ben, why don't you run our, uh, our little uh, film by Bridgestone, thank them for being a sponsor, and then we'll be right back. Oh, we're back. Um, we are welcoming two designers from the Lincoln team with us tonight. And uh, like I mentioned before, these are the true believers in this business that do all the they're in the trenches every day, and they're working to make things better every day. And since they're from the design uh, community, it's one of Jim and I's favorite subjects. So welcome, Susan Lampinen. Thank you. And Susan is the Group Chief Designer, Color and Material Design for Ford and Lincoln. Yes. And Janet Seymour, Colors and Materials Design Manager for the Lincoln Motor Company. Welcome, both. Thank you. Glad to have you here. Thank you for having us. So... Um, you know, it must be pretty cool to work on, to be designers, but to work on Lincoln, which is trying to reinvent themselves. Is that right? Yes, it's um, been an exciting couple of years <laughs> yeah. since the reinvention of Lincoln. We've been uh, working madly, <laughs> really. Yeah. And um, may I ask, how did you get in the business and how did you end up where you are? How would you, how'd you get your start? Uh, well, I attended Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, and I was an industrial design major there. And um, my main focus upon graduation was really to um, pursue product design. And uh, um, more, I was really interested in functional sculpture, actually. I, right. I minored in, in sculpture as well. So, um, 
So I thought I would be traveling off to Europe, actually, and, yeah. and actually secured a job uh, position in Milan. And um, was supposed to fly out to Milan. And, and you ended up in Detroit from Milan? <laughs> I mean, they call it Milan here, and they think it's downriver. <laughs> Yeah, so I was supposed to um, go to Florence for a month and study Italian and then head to Milan to start working for Giorgio Marianelli. <laughs> ah. And, um, um, but Ford actually called me. They recruited me. They had been recruiting since my senior degree project um, was designing, was um, sponsored by Ford. And it was to design an, uh, an advanced future interior concept interior. And um, we were all invited to Dearborn to present and take a tour. And uh, those of us who were interested in interviewing uh, did. I didn't at the time. But somehow when I returned back home, um, I was called and recruited and they wanted to come. And you never thought you'd end up working interview. on cars? No, no. In fact, I felt terrible because uh, many of my classmates did. <laughs> they really wanted the job. So, uh -huh. uh, so I don't know. Somehow I, I got the job, and, and I started as a, um, as a designer in a newly established studio called Advanced Interior Concepts. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were trying to get um, you know, new young designers with a product design background to focus on uh, bring a new perspective to interior design. How about you, Susan? How'd you get it? Oh, I, I love car. It goes back to when I was so small. I've always been creative and loved drawing. And I guess just growing up in the Motor City, you know, I would see these guys draw these incredible cars, and my first car looked like a Kleenex box. And I just had to learn this technique and go for it. So just went to CCS and graduated. Had some great experiences working for different car companies over the years. And so you're a Detroit girl. You're a Motor City yeah, girl. It's in the blood. Yep. Right. So were any of these other companies not located here? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yep. Yeah. One of them out in Los Angeles okay. and Mercedes Benz Advanced Design. Mm -hmm. and was that when Gerhard Steinle was there? Yes. Okay. Yep. And then I had an internship in no in Paris and France. Ah, oh, that's why you were in Paris. Yeah, yes. that earlier. It was a yeah. great summer. And yeah, yeah then, tell us that little. Yeah, oh, that trip. little story. Yeah. That was fabulous. Um, you know, going to going to college and CCS being a smaller school, you really get to know your classmates and become friends with them, and we stay in touch. So having that internship and people at internships around the globe. Well, we met in Paris and um, we drove some great cars down to the south of France and spent some time in the south of France and. So Lamborghini Yelpas and Porsche 959s and going out on cruise ships and... Did the Yelpa make it down without a breakdown? It made it down. No wow. breakdown. Yeah. But very temperamental. Uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> and so when you got to Monaco and you, you know, saw the good life and you had a taste for luxury. Oh, then. That was it. You know, besides living in Paris for the summer and then experiencing that type of luxury and those types of cars, just seeing these beautiful, exotic you know, technology at that time in the 80s and just, wow, like, I have to live this. I have to be the, a part of this all the time. That's when Renault Design was in Biancourt, right? Yes. Okay, so it was, it was before they had opened up correct. the... Correct. Yeah, okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. That was, well, that, that was kind of a, sort of a, weirdly cramped and sometimes primitive facility, wasn't it, for design there? It was older, yeah. Yeah. It was a little different, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. But they did good stuff then? They did great stuff. Was this with uh, Robert Pro? Was he there? No. Okay. I, I don't believe so. If he was, I didn't know him okay. at the time. Yeah. So you found your way to Dearborn? Yes, and then I, I growing up here and then found my way back, um, graduated from CCS, moved to L.A., out there four and a half, five years, came back, worked for Chrysler, and then was there for four and a half years, and I got the call from Ford in 99 and just felt right. Mm -hmm. Yep. And have been at Ford ever since. That was a good time to get mm -hmm. to Ford, too, actually. It was. Yeah. yeah it's been a great journey. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what, yeah. uh, what design trends are you really paying attention to right now? What, what do you think is going to be very uh, hot going forward? It could be exterior or interior. What, what do you think in, is going to be one of the trends? Just one? No. Oh, lots of trends. <laughs> no, lots of trends. Oh, my gosh. Especially trends. in, okay, let's confine it to the luxury segment. Okay. 
Oh, luxury. I, I think um, the luxury segment, you know, everybody's wanted to get into luxury. You know, you have consumers, you know, you've heard this maybe, have heard this term, high-low consumers, where consumers will go out and spend an enormous amount of money on, like, one thing, maybe a handbag or you go out. So luxury has been very watered down. And everybody wants to get in a luxury segment. So trends for the luxury segment, you're going to see more of a focus on getting back to true meaning of luxury and what is that. So I think companies and people are trying to figure this out. But when you're, you're looking at the vision of what is your heritage as a luxury brand like Lincoln, where do you want to go? What is luxury? Um, you, you set a vision you have an aspiration and you really understand what are those values and that exclusivity, that bespokeness, the things that really make up true luxury. And then you go for it and you're relentless and you protect it. I see. It's How does that out. fly though with the concept of platform architectures and component sharing? That's why the designers. That's why I'm asking. Yeah, those are some higher. of our biggest challenges, absolutely. <laughs> yes. yeah. yeah, we have to create yes. beauty and that differentiation and bring that to the product. As much as you can with Within certain a mainstream, more of a mainstream situation. Yeah. I mean, you're not time designing time. for uh, Rolls Royce. Or Bugatti. Or yeah. Bugatti. <laughs> Yes. But more than ever, I feel that there's differentiation between our derivative. It's not a derivative anymore, I feel. It's, it's less of that. Well, they're doing top hats. I mean, the, right. the, the truth is the MKX, excuse me, the MKZ and the Fusion, you actually look at the sheet metal differentiation, it's pretty extensive. I mean, it really is. Yes, it is. It's not as much as the MK. T and the Flex. That one's Correct. amazing. That, right. that, unique top hat. Absolutely. Very I mean, unique top Windshield, heads. A pillars, everything. Yes. Uh, that's an expensive way to do it, though. Yes. So, obviously. It's more investment. Yes. Mm -hmm. Tooling, it's all of that. But mm -hmm. one of the things, if you know, because you're Lincoln only, right? Yes, currently. Okay. Currently, I am. <laughs> then the question is is there a Lincoln, a unique to Lincoln and Lincoln only interior trim color? And if not, why not? Yes, yes there are. We're actually building a portfolio of um, Lincoln color materials that are specific only to Lincoln. Mm -hmm. And that includes interior color, exterior colors, um, finishes, wood finishes, aluminum appliques, mm -hmm. even plating down to the details. Um, we're redefining our stitching as well so that it's differentiated from Ford. Uh, so are you talking about, when you say you're talking about style rather than simply color, right? Um, for us, from a color and material standpoint, because that's our area of expertise. But I mean, different expertise. kinds of stitching, too. Yes. You know, you can do double French seams, French seams, right. cross stitch, and so on. So, but you're, you're not down to that detail yet. Uh, we are. Oh, okay. We are. We are working on that currently. Okay. We're trying to add more differentiation as that's possible. MKZ on the screen, correct? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. And this is really the first of the four Lincolns that are coming out in the next three years, mm -hmm. right, um, the plan, but the, the next new vehicle that's coming out and the three coming up, mm -hmm. uh, we are implementing this new strategy that so we're working on. where do you most get your inspiration? Is it just in everyday life? Is it the things you do? Uh, is it life experiences? Is it your... Uh, connection to fashion? What, where, is there any one thing or is it everything? So many things really. Um, we spend a lot of time, uh, well as much time as we can because we have to handle all of the, uh, you know, getting the cars into production aspects of it. But um, yes, we spend quite a bit of time doing um, <coughs> cross-industry trend research and, and not only just fashion and getting uh, the latest color cues and the color trends um, from fashion and furnishing industries and products, but um, I think we're delving more into um, expanding more into more like experiential type ex um, inspirations as well. Uh, looking at a lot of uh, travel destinations or, you know, what do our Lincoln Target customers like to experience? Is it, you know, fine dining at a top rated New York restaurant called Per Se? Or is it, you know, seeking, um, you know, the most delectable chocolates designed by an artisan chocolatier in Paris. You know, it's um, that type of experience that we're trying to seek right now as, an, um, as inspiration because as remote as it is um, to an automobile interior, we feel that remote experience actually um, can garner more unique 
uh, elements out of that um, that we can tra then translate into automotive uh, applications as well. So. Now, have, have you guys been to that fashion, the fashion week in Milan, or the, I forget what it's called, it's an industry show, the design show? Have not. Okay. We've been to Linea Pelle show in Italy, I went two years ago, yeah. which is a big... So is fashion, uh, 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 is fashion where you spend a lot of time looking at color and textures and We fabric? do look at a lot of fashion, yes. Most yeah. definitely in terms of color trends, um, but then it's, fashion is, you know, so far out in terms of um, the stuff you know, where we're going to catch up. Exactly, it's bleeding edge, actually. Right, right. So it's really a peak. How do we then take those cues, design cues for the future, and translate that so it's automotive applicable? So. Well, because yes, automotive design is fashion, right? <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. A lot of materials that are equated to be part of what a luxury car has in them. Leather, to me, is is just one of them. Luxurious leather, the things that make leather luxurious, in some cases, make it incredibly fragile. And an automobile is one of the worst environments for some things. When you've got sun load inside the interior, a cabin can go up to 200 degrees Fahrenheit if it's parked out in the sun in Phoenix and so on. You can't do that. Conversely, leather is the luxury feature that's democratized. I mean, you can get leather in, in a, a Chevy Cruze, for example, or yeah, Focus. I, so I, I happen to think leather is... Passe is a luxury thing. That's what I'm wondering. What about fabrics? Because the truth mm -hmm. is fabrics, they're things you can do with weaves and so on that are far more interesting than things you can do with leather. Because leather, it's let's grain it or not grain it. But I think, you know, the American consumer, that will take a long time for the American consumer. I mean, it would have to be the elite consumer. I mean, the enthusiast consumer who understands, well, leather is leather. This is special. But for the general populace, oh, you got to have leather in it. That's going to be a challenge. But, but the thing is, if you're trying to sell a luxury automobile that is truly a luxury automobile, not a luxury branded automobile, not a checklist luxury car. What's the biggest oxymoron in the business? Near luxury. Oh, don't get me started. <laughs> low lux was the other one I always liked. Oh, that's a low luxury car. Well, Excuse near, me? When I hear near luxury, it's just like, and I'm at a media event and someone says, I almost want to interrupt the press. Conference. Excuse me? Will you please stop saying that? Yes, we're in the near luxury segment. Huh? Okay. What is near luxury, by the way? Please. It's like, I didn't mean to interrupt. Okay. But, but, no, but it, the, the thing is that if you really want to pursue luxury, and if you're, going to, if you're looking for some clear space, in, in arguably, you know, it, there's an argument. You could say there's not room for Lincoln in the luxury segment. I could see someone making that argument because it's sitting here duking it out with these other guys that haven't seated themselves, like Infinity still isn't there. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. You know, Johan won't like hearing that, the guy that runs it. But they're not there yet. Uh, Acura never got there. I mean, Acura really are making sort of the Buick equivalent of Hondas right now. They're very good, but they're technology cars. Techno luxury is not just technology. And you can have technology without luxury, and you can have luxury without technology. And if you doubt it, look at a Rolls Royce. Um, is, it, is it in your best interest to get out and try to set something to, to help redefine what luxury is or be more in touch with a part of luxury that's not automotive? Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. I think that's something that a lot of our customers still want leather, and you can do different types of leather, yeah. you know, whether it's grained or ungrained, but then there's different qualities of leather, and then offering those very premium quality leathers. And an area that we're going into is just this area where we're exploring non-leather alternatives. You know, you hear Alcantara suede, mm -hmm. the different suede looks, those are fabrics. Um, but then beyond that, there's things that have come into the luxury segment or have always been in the true luxury segment, which are non-leathers. It's combinations of premium materials that give further opportunity to unique looks. And so I think that's something that as we go forward in the future, especially for very high-end Lincolns, you're going to start seeing some wonderful opportunities expressed through Alternatives the to the traditional. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes, very much so. There was uh, a Saab 9000 and there was a the word got out when, when recycling of cars was really big in Europe, where the Europeans actually mandated vehicles have to be recyclable. Um, in Sweden, the Swedes came to the conclusion you can't recycle leather. In the traditional sense of recycling, it cannot be recycled. It has to be sort of repurposed. That's about all you can do with it. And so uh, Saab developed a wool interior for a car. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
and they gave the design of the material to Xenia. Mm -hmm. And they did these cars. They're very rare, but it was available in the States. And it was basically, it looked like a pinstripe suit in the car. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It looked incredibly upscale. It was unlike anything mm -hmm. you'd seen. Yeah. And are, would, you, would you guys be brave enough to do something like that? Oh, or is that yes. too? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yes. yes. And I'm saying copy them, mm -hmm. but, but getting yeah. something that is a, a non-traditional, but obviously very expensive way to, to approach it. And the way it's mm -hmm. executed and the way it comes together mm -hmm. is it's all about that. It's doing it in the right way, making it automotive appropriate in a luxury way that infers certain meanings, you know, and there's a rich meaning behind this. Mm -hmm. Yes. I, I think we're going to see, uh, we're going to, more on this later, we're going to see uh, Lincoln make a statement at Pebble Beach. They're the presenting mark at yeah. Pebble Beach, and we'll be hearing and seeing uh, their work then. We'll you should see if Ralph Lauren will pose with your car. <laughs> Which they can't talk about now, by the way. If they had a car, such a thing existed, yeah. yeah. So I can't talk about, but it's pretty cool stuff. So. And then there are elements of those things that we're working on for the future as well. So. Yeah. We are most definitely. Yeah. On it, it. It's it's really it's an exciting time because Janet and I worked years ago for Lincoln when Lincoln was trying to transform itself in the early 2000s, and we're as a team again. And this time, there's we've kind of given the unleashing by our senior management to make some innovative, creative, appropriate statements for Lincoln for where we really need to go to really become that true luxury brand that we once were and are going after. And it's, I mean, we're actually having fun and <laughs> enjoying, you know, showing up each day and... Well, to be given uh, the closest thing to a free reign in this town is yeah. pretty exciting. It's, yes. it's really yeah, mm -hmm. Really exciting. If you go back and look at the 61 Lincoln in context, mm -hmm. which to me was an absolute mm -hmm. breakthrough car. Yes. There were all these things that were absolutely wrong about it for the luxury segment. Totally wrong. Okay. It was smaller. It was not decorated. It was in a colossally, I mean, it was an exquisitely beautiful automobile, mm -hmm. but it didn't fit in with what luxury was. So they were ballsy. They did it, decided to do it. And they had, you know, think of the car that preceded it. Mm -hmm. The 58, 59. They did it, decided to I, hear, I, I know, boy, I'm in trouble over that one. That's, that's the No, no, we're on the Internet, but, Ben, we had a, we had a little we had a burp. audio thing going on. You look, at, you look at the six, 58, 59, and 60 Lincolns, and from a design standpoint, they were so space-age, but they were absolutely awful. Mm -hmm. They were trying to out-gorp Cadillac, and they did it. So they did those cars. In a way, doesn't it behoove you to look at, to do what the 61 did? Don't do a 61 because they've tried that too much and you're not going to do it better. And you can't even take that form and make it relevant now. Although, but, although Jerry McGovern came close. He did not come close. I I'm like sorry. The car. There's a difference between liking it and saying it was successful. Well, that was the first it, it car wasn't ever successful because they buried it. It, it mm -hmm. wasn't successful even for being what the 61 yes, was. It was. No. The interior was That was fabulous. the first car I looked at and said the wheels are too big and I never thought I'd say that. <laughs> the interior was fabulous. No. Yes. We'll we'll talk about this it was later. White. Remember? <laughs> yes, I do. It was beautiful. We worked on that actually. <laughs> I <love laughs> we worked on that. Sorry, that, that was, I that thought was, it was great. Uh -huh. it well, was, forget it the was, wagon wheel. I agree. I it was it. too <laughs> much trying to do what they did before in a different context where it was never gonna work. But the thing is, to me it behooves Lincoln to say, what is the equivalent of that car now? What's the car that doesn't fit in but fits ahead of where cars are gonna have to be? Well, that's probably what they're working on right now, Jim. Well, I hope they are. Yes. But, and, and the thing is, I love the MKZ, but the MKZ doesn't push the needle that far. It doesn't. The MKZ is a very, 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 very pretty car. Yes. But, you know, I mean, okay, it's... It really and, wasn't designed to push the needle. I think you have to kind of walk into... It's, yeah, it's an initial this, foray, you know, Jim. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I understand that. Mm -hmm. But it, it's going to have to be a car that some people will be very uncomfortable looking at. And I mean exceedingly uncomfortable looking at because that's exactly what the 61 was. Yeah, well, that, the MKZ is not uncomfortable to look at. It's a pretty car. I think it's a very pretty car. I think, you know, we, we forget being in this town. It's just starting to get into the... The real world. Into the real world. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, apparently the buzz is pretty good initially. So um, we'll have to see. I'm more excited about what they have coming. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So before we get into rapid fire... Knowing you, your loyalty to Lincoln and everything, what, what company's products do you appreciate? Could be cars, could be designers, could be purse makers. Furniture. Furniture. Brands. Hmm. Well, if you like a brand, something's wrong. 
That's zombieism. That's aesthetic zombieism. I'm well, sorry. Well, it depends on what you're mm -hmm. talking about, Jim. Not if it's clothes. <laughs> Susan, do you want to answer well, this one? We were talking earlier before we were, you know. Bugatti. A Bugatti. Oh, my gosh. Mm -hmm. I so would I just love to have one of those in my garage. The Viron. Oh, yes. I mean, it's it's beautiful. I mean, just you, you walk up to it, you smile, you walk away. You just have to turn around not once, but it's twice. It's also astonishingly small for what it, it is. It is small for what it is, but the technology, and what it's, a, um, it's a machine. Oh, it's, it's a machine. It's incredible. The design, the, the, the materials, the, the quality. Oh, my gosh. I, I just dream of, oh, I dream. I'm drooling. Yes. What about you, Janet? Do you have one? Oh, um, I think. I think I am partial to Audis. Yeah. I like the Audi R8. So um, I wish I had could drive it. Actually, I've never driven one so far, so uh, I should make that like a it. point for me. But the nice thing about the mm -hmm. designers mm -hmm. in this business, they appreciate uh, other designers' work. I mean, you have to. Oh yeah. And that's good. I mean, you can't be. You know, this, you live in a vacuum if you're ignoring yeah, what's yeah. going on around you. Because yeah. somebody's going to do something that's going to have merit. I mean, it just happens. It's, these are creative works. Yeah. It's like saying the only sculptures I like are Remingtons. It's like, God help you. Yes. So you clearly like cars. I was going to ask you that, but you both do. And, but it's essential for a designer to like and appreciate the business and cars, don't you think, if you're going to be in it? Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, if you're going to be immersed in it every day, you We're better, immersed in them, yeah. you better like it. 60 hours a week, <laughs> so. Yeah. Absolutely. So, well, it's great. So now we're going to go to the exciting part of the show. Rapid fire, Ben, let's roll that thing. Here's a question. It says, a question for the Lincoln designer. Well, there are two, but that's okay. I love the new styling of Lincoln. Any chance there's a two-door rear-wheel drive vehicle in the near future? I'll answer that for you. Uh, probably not in the near future. Maybe down the road. Uh, Eric Ambrose asks, how do men or women perceive luxury touch points differently? Steering wheel, shifter, door handle, buttons, etc." cetera. Good question. I don't know if there's a difference between men and women. Maybe the only difference in terms of touch point are nails for uh, women. So we do keep in mind uh, with some of the buttons and the switches that there's nail clearance. Mm -hmm. But other than that, I think um, no from difference. a touch feel, yeah. Yeah, a good feeling door handle feels like a good feeling door handle it regardless. Feels solid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So Raman Koch asks, doesn't Lincoln really need a hail car to change people's perspective? Uh, I'll answer that. Yes, probably. And yes, they're working on it. Uh, VRM Chris, Jim, question for you. Have you looked at past Lincolns, especially interiors, for inspiration and future Lincolns? Well, that's for you guys. Yeah. But we just discussed previous Lincoln. I look at the interior of the Lincoln Mark 8 and think if we revise somewhat for the future, it could be awesome with the technology available today. I don't know, VRM, Chris, we're going to move on. A digital Cartier clock? <laughs> Mike D. White asks, why did you choose a push-button transmission for the MKZ? We didn't pick the push-button transmission. But it was to clear the space in the center console and once so that you, you didn't once have that your decision was made, yeah. you we designed it. Absolutely. It was, yeah. to, it was to keep a very clean uh, appearance with that bridge type structure. And um, it just freed up so much space to be able to put storage underneath it. And, um, and yeah, once I, you do that, there's a, there's, there's a limited way, a limited number of things you can do, but you could do it in any manner of ways. Those mm -hmm. buttons could have been, mm -hmm. I mean, the, yeah, to me, it's right. Sure. But the, the buttons could have been linear like they are on an Aston Martin, because yes. Astons yes. have auto, uh, push button transmissions as well. Mm -hmm. yes. So it's, it's, you know. For I think it works. Yeah, it's got continuity too, because it's near the hand, mm -hmm. so you understand them, yeah. you're not okay. reaching across. Here's mm -hmm. one for you, Jim. Okay. Don Braun asks, what exactly is 2953 Analytics? I can't find a website. There's a website, but you have to find, figure, figure out another way to think about 2953. Okay. Uh, it's, a, it's an automotive analysis practice. We keep practice it, analyzing it things. It's yep. a secret. It's for clients. It's for clients. Andrew, Send us money and I'll tell you. Yeah. <laughs> Andrew Charles asks, do you think Lincoln's path is made easier by BMW and Mercedes developing more and more models? 
such as the CLA, to transverse powertrain platforms to save costs. I, I don't know. I don't think their path is made easier. If anything, it makes it harder because suddenly they've got a broader spectrum of product, actually. Well, you know, that... It may be too broad, but the point is, yeah. if you look at the Mercedes range right now, you have uh, basically, what, three, four crossovers, because you still have an R-Class. You've got there are too many cars. That's what I'm saying. So the, the broadening of it, if you want to try to compete on every point, it makes it more difficult. But All right. the Mercedes range is too broad. Uh, <laughs> I, Scott in Cleveland. Peter, what's your opinion on the 2015 Chevrolet City Express? I don't have one, Scott, sorry. Well, it's, a, it's just like, it's the same as my opinion on the Nissan NV220 with a bow tie. Yeah. Or NV200. The commercial van, it's kind of weird. Brian asked, will Mark Rice get his wish for a cheaper wheel drive Chevy in the vein of the Subaru Toyota Coupes, Jim? Well, it ain't dead yet. Maybe. Yes. <laughs> uh, let's see. Eli Bartel in Danville, Virginia asks, in today's climate for luxury brands, which ones, foreign and domestic, will proliferate where others fail? I also would be interested in hearing what luxury brand vehicle you would choose if given in the opportunity. I think we already covered that, but I don't really know what he's getting at. Do you have a comment, Jim? No. Um, there, there are luxury brands that play in the... In the, in the pool, but they aren't really luxury yet, and if they don't earn it, they're always going to be these, they will define what near luxury is, actually. They actually will. That'll be the definition of near luxury. Yeah. It's like almost there. And uh, there are a bunch playing in it now, because technically, I'd say Infinity's there, Acura's there. Lexus finally got up to first tier, but it's been a long and bloody trudge, and they're still defined by the RX and the ES, which are not luxury automobiles. No, they're not. Hey, Ben, we have a phone call. Let's hear it. Hi guys, this is Chad W, uh, 17 miles south of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Um, the chin spoilers on the Focus, Fusion, Escape, the new Malibu and the Corvette, and also notice on the Mazda 3 and 5, have a nodule, or maybe you'd describe it as a dorsal fin type shape on each side of the grill opening. Oh, yeah. Do any of you guys know what uh, aerodynamic issue they're trying to solve with this? Yeah. Thanks for any input. One of the things that's happening is they're trying to have air uh, dams in front of the wheels to reduce the turbulence in the wheel arch. So they're doing those there. They're also doing them back under the car. Some cars actually have little tiny skegs down in front. That is pretty much a style element of trying to bring that part of the fascia down without having the fascia look like it's just got a notch cut out of it. It's functionally extending the fascia on the outer edges. And you know, what you're looking at is style. It's functional, but it, didn't, it doesn't have to look that way. Yeah. RWDS, I saw some pretty spectacular interior lighting on a new Lincoln at the car show. Must be the MKC. Mm -hmm. But I didn't see anything like that at the dealer. Was that just for fun or something that might be coming? Mm. The concept. Yeah. It's a concept. Mm -hmm. Concept. More on that later. Yes. Apparently. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Oh, I'm getting some more. Push to start. Ask: Are there luxury items or features that are protected or kept for Lincoln that Ford products cannot implement? I think, in terms of what our role would be is a color material perspective. There are unique Lincoln colors and materials that are kept, designed, developed, and protected for Lincoln that Ford absolutely cannot touch. I mean, you'd have Off to. Off limits. You'd have to do that yeah. to make it work. Yeah. And we're expanding the palettes. So we're getting even more exclusive. So there'll be more, there'll be more oh, differentiation from a, just a palette much. standpoint. Yes. Very much. Mm -hmm. A color, material. They've got yeah. some radical stuff coming. Yeah. It won't be radical enough for me. I know, Jim. Well, I short of you getting to come down visit there and sewing it I, yourself. I remember the Porsche uh, Panamera, the Carrera Panamera, Panamerica. Do you remember the concept? Oh, yeah. With the zipper roof. Yeah. Pretty radical. That's what I thought the Cayenne should have been. You're, if you're going to do it, uh, that's that's a Porsche sport Pop utility vehicle. Yep. Yeah. There was this psychotic. That was at the Chicago show. Was it the Chicago yes. show? There was this psychotic sort of off-road 911 that was done as a concept. Oh, and so it cool. was 
immensely radical. Uh, it was one of the. It was in the 80s, so of course they were using wetsuit material for seats. Because you remember when that was I big? Remember, yes. yeah. You remember the car? It was turquoise. Yeah, and I don't remember the car, but I remember all this the zippering, the wetsuits. Zipper yeah, exactly. On many different types of. It, products. it was yeah. a, a pretty radical. Yep. Approach too. It was. I mean, you looked at it. And it was kind of a 911. And then it was nothing like you'd ever seen before. I thought it was brilliantly done. It was a, I think it was a, one of the cars harmed it. I'm not sure. Or he had a little twerp doing it for him because uh, he was great. Who was the guy that did the, the uh, Boxster concept? Uh, young American that was working for Harm at the time and did a knockdown drag out job on it. It was great. I remember when they showed the Boxster at the Detroit show. It was like, yep. wow. It had fans in each of the air vents. Yeah. <laughs> <A> turbine. <laughs> They're little electric fans. You could actually use like, wow. So we're, uh, we're approaching the end. Jim, is there anything else we need to cover while we have our guests here? Yeah, it's a comment about the MKZ, and that's that I, I like the MKZ, but when I sit in the interior, it feels like I'm sitting in a sketch, in that everything is there. It looks great, but there, it, there is something that is not substantial about the car when I'm sitting in it, and I don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. it's a, it's a, I don't know whether it's tactile, visual, or whether it's a combination of the two, and it may be a combination of the two. Mm -hmm. And I like it, but, and I, I can't figure out what's going on with it. Um, it's, because the, the MK, the MKZ interior is a borderline radical interior. For the segment, it's very radical. It actually mm -hmm. is, to the point where I can see some buyers, that'll be a filter where they won't buy. Not a problem. You're not going to get everybody in the car anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but there's, and I, I don't know what it is. And I, the thing is, it, I know that's got to be a thing. Luxury is about substance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's not, it's not that you're not using the right materials. Mm -hmm. I, it, what's missing is a sense of occasion, which is part of what luxury is. Mm -hmm. And it's absent in that car. It's totally absent. Mm -hmm. So it's more like it's, 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 I hate to use the word, it's eyewash. It's the visual stuff without the the entertainment and the involvement. I mean, because any car can have a push-button shifter. You have a push-button shifter, okay? And it works like pushing a button. There's nothing special about the feel. Yet, there are things that you do in a car every single time you drive that car. And if you can make those things special, if you bring that sense of occasion to them, every time you get in the car, the customer is reminded of that. And there are some cars that do that. Well... The interesting challenge for the Lincoln Motor Company is they sort of have to sell to the people who are predisposed to the brand from past experiences mm -hmm. while bringing in new people to the brand. So They didn't do that with a 61. No, they didn't bother. They did what was the right car to do. Yeah, but that was... But what I mean is they... That whenever was then, you, and this is Remember back then they did whatever they wanted. I know, but the problem is when you try to do what you're doing, you end up sitting on the fence, and it means there will be one element... You will not commit the right way for one, and you'll do it for the other, and you will never do the right car doing that. You will always be doing less than you can. And, and luxury is not about doing the, le the less than you can. It's about doing more than you think you can. Right, but this is the modern automobile industry where hand-wringing goes hand-in-hand hand with everything they do. Nothing ventured, nothing gained, and if they go halfway at it, Jim, it ain't going to work. You're preaching the choir. I know it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hey, it's been a great show. I'd really like to thank our special Sorry. guests. Didn't mean that to be a downer. It's not a downer. I mean, you know, after hours, we talk about stuff. I know. And, you know, so that's Susan Lampinen. Thank you for being thank here. Thank you. And Janet Seymour, thank you. We really appreciate it. Again, when we speak about true believers in this business, these are two examples of them. And uh, they work tirelessly for what they do. And it's pretty cool to have them on here. And uh, be sure to check out Jim Hall's Designed Handbook Lessons. They're Every, not lessons. They're, you know, simply... There are many lectures, Jim. There are many lectures, yes. Yes. Every Thursday on Online Daily. And what's coming up for Design Handbook? Oh, you, we already talked about yeah, that. Yeah, uh, the thing is, I don't know which of those we're going to air. But I, I know which one I'd like to do. I'd like to do style versus design because it's... Oh, sports car proportions will be the next one. Yes. Sports car proportions. Very good. I like Thank that. Thank you. I will look forward to that. And you can get all my stuff at autoextremist.com, of course. And you can follow the Twitter account for Auto Extremist. Uh, or no, Twitter is Peter M. DiLorenzo, my name, because there was a, a rogue element out there trying to steal it. Uh, and I'm on Facebook, but it's just the site. You know, I'm, I don't appear there. 
And you can friend AutoLine at Facebook.com slash AutoLine Network. And you can follow AutoLine on Twitter at Twitter.com slash AutoLine. And I really thank you, everyone, for being here. And thanks to our guests. Thank you, Jim. It's thank always you. a pleasure. And we'll see you next time. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone, your journey, our passion. Visit our website, autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday nights at 6 p.m. Eastern. Get your daily news fix with Autoline Daily and in depth analysis and interviews with Autoline This Week. There's all that and much more at autoline.tv.